the new extended teaser trailer is out, with new shots and a new job. I may be a week or two later than I'd like, but since I finally have time to really look at it, I thought I'd go through it with a fine tooth comb, as much as I can anyways. Before we get into it, this is just the extended teaser trailer, and I'm gonna work off a lot of the information I laid down in the last trailer analysis. Worth remembering that we do still have a full trailer to go that we'll probably get at the Japanese Fan Festival, so don't think there aren't more things to be revealed. Like, say, another job possibly delivered to us in a cryo-shaped package. The point of all this is for fun, speculative analysis, and to help point out things you may have not noticed. So if I get it wrong, or if you don't agree, that's fine. I'd just like to enjoy the trip to Dawn Trail together. Shall we begin? For the first minute or so, the trailers are almost identical, with the Warrior of Light still hiding their new job and on their way to Tural, with Alfino and Aaronville. Thanks to the bits we got from 6.5, we know Alfino and Alice are headed to the New World as an expedition to find new connections for the rebuilding of Garlemald, so that Garlemald might be more interconnected with the world, like they now are with Eorzea and Thavnir. Though, everybody else just wants them to take a vacation. Aaronville, on the other hand, has some business to attend to, probably regarding his home of Aaronville where he gets his name. The first shift we get isn't actually visual, but audible, as a slightly different rendition of the Dawn Trail theme plays, probably because the trailer is longer and the timing to the music needs to be changed. And we'll keep seeing this because there are a couple shots throughout that have been noticeably abbreviated or elongated compared to the original teaser. While this shot may not be new, we do have a new piece of information, and that's where these falls and cliffs are, and that is Kozumaoka, a tropical region south of Tulio Lal, so somewhere within this section of the map. The craggy cliffs are in the west, and the waters that make the falls flow come from here. First visual change, however, has to do with the Mammal Jaw expedition, foraging through the jungle, but it's so brief that there isn't really anything to say. In the next shot, however, while everything about the framing is the same, the Mammal Jaw have actually been re-rendered with slightly altered animations. Since we know that there have been objects rendered out, or slight alterations in the past, between teasers and the full trailer, it's not a new thing and it could be chalked up to the earlier teaser needing to get out before it was as polished as the team liked. Or even just feedback after it was released. Nothing really changes. The Buniwa and Hubigo are all the same, but the Mammal Jaw do look more dynamic in their movements. Estinian's arrival marks the first big juicy change with his smackdown with Mr. Kaiju. The monster breaks free from the water, and with its red glowing chest, it seems like I may have actually been right, for once, in pointing out its connection last time to Gaoro, in some all hard. It is the same physical form and red energy coursing through it, so it seems like the Azure Dread Goon just can't get away from dragon-associated beasts, wherever he goes. One thing that's off is his back horn frills thingy. They have this purple hue that Gauro doesn't have, and what it reminds me of is these formations and energy we saw in the concept art and dungeon images throughout the two fanfests. It seems like this purple energy that I'm just gonna call corruption has affected these areas, but maybe also the wildlife of Yakturao. It also seems tied not only to the Golden City, but possibly the futuristic civilization locales like in this image. The concept art and screenshots basically deserve their own video and speculation, so let's set that aside for now. Back at the battle between Astinian and the Garou creature, the Dragoon channels his Aether to leap high into the air, which is a cool nod to the lore of the job, and plows right back down, and thanks to the next shot, seems to have landed the killing blow. The lyrics from the prior version of the Dawn Trail song come in, referencing the prior expansions, as the Mammal Jaw cook up some heavy hunk and steaks, and the procession of hunters Astinian was with are carrying their kill from the outside into the city. The Garou could be subdued for training, like I speculated last vid, but the juxtaposition with the steaks and lack of red or purple glow make me assume that Gaujira is toast. Next up we get a version of an old shot, with Astinian being praised by the Mammal Jaw children, now recontextualized to be their joy at the fresh meat he's helped bring in. And this might give us a hint towards which scions fall on which sides of the upcoming contest, with Astinian shown to be more closely tied to the native Turalians, in this case. Panning on up from there, we can see the outside of the throne room glinting, and the angle suggests I was right about the gate Astinian was coming from in the western side of Tuliolal. But since the trailers always have a ton of creative license, I still may be jumping the gun by making any assumptions. In the throne room, we face off with Gulul Jaja, just like before, and nothing changes in the entire shot, but there will be more to this scene oh so very soon. With the flame dropping into the sugar apple, we have an addition to this shot, with Alice thanking and waving gratefully to the Mammal Jaw for the gift, who seems in an equally pleasant mood. This goes along with the Astinian point I was making before, and who might align with which side. The candidate for the other side I can think of still being the newcomers to Tural, who are seeking out its resources, like Cerulean. We know that conflict like that has been going on even before our arrival, thanks to stories like the Blue Mage quest. From there, we're right into Yustola's shot, which has been edited down in a way that's honestly a little jarring, but gets us to the target of what she's looking down at. 
Now, last time, I'm pretty sure I joked and threw out a guess at something like Runar if 6.5 allowed for cross-realm travel. And while interreflection travel is more a reality now than ever, it being regular is a long way off. And as a side note, because I got more than a few comments, I have no stake in the game if Yashola does or does not end up with Runar. It really doesn't matter to me much one way or the other. But she kinda gotta ignore the text of 5.0 and 5.x to say that there was no groundwork laid. We did, however, get something just as furry and far more fluffy. The Nutkin! This oh-so-very-fluffy boy has been a mainstay throughout the story, or at least throughout memes, with him hiding Thancred's to acorns and all. But why is he in Tural? So, there are a few possibilities. Squirrels being common to the North Americas, maybe this little buddy is actually a native of the greater Tural as a whole. We even see this little guy with a peanut rather than an acorn, which in the real world are native to the South Americas. And so far we've seen a lot of food references to both Mezzo and South America. But let's set that aside, because there is another more interesting connection. In the text of the Nutkin minion, we get the line, Inspired by the words of Millilith Ironheart, this daring squirrel longs to travel the realm in search of the legendary golden acorn, and hopes that trailing in your shadow will ensure that he isn't eaten before he discovers the mother load. Millith being the NPC who introduces us to sightseeing logs in 2.x. Her words seem to have got the Nutkin raring to seek the ultimate prize of the Golden Acorn, and with us in search of a Golden City, maybe there's some sort of erroneous or actual link. And this boy has snuck aboard our boat in Journey. I will say, whether serious or as a running gag throughout 7.0, the idea of this little guy popping up on repeat would be rather funny. There's actually one more interesting thing I want to point out. Well, I don't want to say it pushes towards the Golden Acorn idea, but it's at least noteworthy. The last time we had a meeting with the Nutkin was during the Secret in the Box quest in Charlian, where Thancra's espionage mentor in disguise offered us a secret box and a mission to find its keys. But one of those keys we get by talking to a Nutkin, or, well, a student in disguise as a Nutkin, and giving them the passcode Golden Acorn. And while that is probably just a funny callback to a minion, it is interesting that they were thinking about it as late as 6.0, when the minion came about all the way back in patch 2.3. It's funny though that the Nutkin was with Yashola rather than Thancred, since we've historically seen them as a pair. And even Thancred's Encyclopedia Eorzea Volume 1 entry states, His boon companion is a Nutkin, who has saved the Archon from several rather embarrassing situations. From this chat on for the next little bit, there really isn't anything new to say. We've got the glorious Takotia again, Thancred asking some ladies for directions, and Urianje with his pina colada. We do get an extra few frames of Thancred walking up to the ladies, but really nothing else. I guess it's worth noting that the scene with Estinian and the Mamaljaw children has been moved from this section in the original trailer to earlier in the new teaser trailer, but that's most likely just for timing reasons. But now, let's move on to the meat of things. That's right, Corsair, I mean Viper! With the hidden weapon revealed and the Warrior of Light dancing with twin blades, the Viper is looking like a fast-paced melee DPS, with some kind of stance switching between the dual and double-sided blades. Though probably not stances where you choose between the two, and more of a flowing between the two, like Monk's stances or Reapers and Shroud. So first off, I just want to say Viper looks cool as hell. And while I may be a filthy tank main, I'm looking forward to trying it out. However, based on historical evidence with other new melee DPS, I will prime you to expect a lot of people dying while playing Viper in the early weeks of 7.0. I still have the image of Reapers yeeting themselves into oblivion seared into my mind. But hey, maybe not much has actually changed there. And for all those Darth Maul cosplayers out there, I sense a combo of Palace of the Dead weapons and Viper lies in your future. Back on the trailer. With Galul Jaja slamming a pillar and the Warrior of Light breaking through the fire, we get the reveal of the second sword a perfect copy of the other one the Warrior of Light wields. The Warrior of Light uses a technique that causes, or leaves, a trail of Aether that might act like blades in their own right, and as we'll see in a second, when the Warrior of Light combines the two swords, it seems the swords can act as some kind of foci for Aether to a degree. In the live letter, Yoshi P described the two swords style as a swift form and the double-bladed form as a heavy hitting mode, which matches the acrobatic fast movements with the twin blades, and once the Warrior of Light combines the swords pommel to pommel through some form of ethereal manipulation, the Viper movements slow a bit, and the attacks are more long, strong swipes. Added to that, we can see from the Warrior of Light's face that they seem to be having a blast, which carries along with the idea I had last time that the fight with Gulul Jaja is more of A TEST OF YOUR REFLEXES than a fight out of animosity. For some out-of-trailer information, let's look at the Viper trailer a second. We know that the Viper is a dex melee, so scouting gear will be their setup and that the Viper as a practice comes from Turalian hunters, who pass it down through the generations. But we don't know if these hunters are Mamul Jaw or from other tribes. 
And it's just as possible that the Viper is not exclusive to one race. Since few jobs, even when founded by a specific group, like Gunbreaker or Dragoon, stay amongst that group. Using their soul crystals, Vipers can channel the experience of past hunters, which grant them powerful skills for short bursts, and they're described as a high OGCD job. So be prepared for a lot of weaving, and for those of you with high ping, pray to whichever the 12 you hold as your patron. Soul crystals acting as foci for powers and abilities isn't anything new. Most of them either act in a similar manner, or at least have some sort of oddity to them, from Dark Knight to Scholar. But this channeling almost reminds me of something like The Revenant from Guild Wars 2, and it'll be interesting to see if we channel only one prior hunter's power, or more over time, via their memories. We even get to see this channeling in the Viper trailer. Viper as a job is acquired in Uldah, which might surprise some people since Limsa seems the obvious choice, but I think there are a few reasons Uldah might make sense. First off, just like Limsa, Uldah has been a seat for travelers coming through Eorzea for trade and other reasons, as well as a hive of activity for those hiding from people and parts of the world, like we see with the Lemire. Its crossroad nature and mercantile seat means that if someone were to, say, hire a guard, or be seeking people who practice exotic and hitherto unknown arts, Uldah itself is rife with said types. Beyond that, if the devs wanted to show off the contention between natives in the natural world versus those who would exploit it for profit, well, Uldah has that history in spades, and that's to say nothing of their history with tribal groups and stories like the Blue Mage quest. It makes me wonder if the future caster won't be in Gridania, since it has its own deep relationship with nature versus man. But that's pretty rampant speculation. Back to the main trailer. As we fly through the skylight in the throne room of Tulialal, we get the bright sun of day, and the final shot of the trailer with one change. Well, technically, two changes. The first off is a shot that I swear almost feels like it's mocking us with the Warrior of Light placing their hand on the second sword's hilt. The second change is said sword is now rendered into the final shot. With a zoom out, we see Tulio Lal one last time, and bam, title card for Dawn Trail. Okay, so that about wraps things up for now. What a nice teaser to wet the palette for leaving us wanting more. Or maybe you disagree. Are you excited for Viper? Do you wish it had been something else? Let me know what you think down below. At some point, maybe before or right after Japanese Fan Festival, I want to deep dive into a lot of the art and screenshots we've seen, as I think they play heavily into what we've seen so far, especially this purple corruption, which I think will play a large role in the story. But all that's for another time. In the meantime, stay safe, Archons. Thanks for watching. Hey all, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, praise the 12 by giving it a like and comment, or by subscribing. It goes a long way to helping the channel. Don't forget, new videos every week, and if you want to engage with us further, why not check out our Discord and Patreon in the link below and become a part of our community. With that said, see you around, fellow Archons.